talk about is prayer preparing for the vision. How many of you know that we're going to have a session following church today where we're going to talk about our personal vision? What, are we, what is it that we believe God is saying to us, how God is directing us, what God wants us to do to call us into a life that finds itself in the center of God's will? Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yes. Amen. A lot of us, when we pray, you know, what are the kind of things we're concerned about? When we pray, we want God to pay attention to the kinds of things we want. We pray to God for our desires. What are some of your desires that you pray about? Just rattle them off real quick. Money. Money. Lord, I need some more money. How many of y'all need some more money? All right. The rest of y'all whose hands did not go up. I have my hand out at the end of the service. You can give me all of your excess. <laughs> and what else do we pray about when we pray for our desires? Peace? Good health? Bigger health? <laughs> what did you say? Understanding? Big, bigger house? Good What you say? Family members? A good retirement. A good retirement. What is a good retirement anyway? I think my friend, Reverend Keith Olsen, is going to talk a little bit about what, what a good retirement is. He's been retired for a little bit better than a year, Keith. Amen. A little bit better than a year. Not have to go back to work anymore. That's a good retirement. Not have to go back to work anymore. Deacon Ratliff. My prayer is that Jesus will come back today. You pray that Jesus will come back today. Today. That's what I want. Seriously, with Dick and Radley. Let's see too many hands going like next week. Like next week, next week will be all right. All right. You, all right, okay, man. You, you have one person to join you, uh, Dick, and I want to, you know, I'm, I'm kind of selfish. I want to hang around a little while. Hang around. <laughs> well, the world is a mess. <laughs> it is a mess, but even in the mess, I don't know, maybe something's wrong. <laughs> I want to hang around a little while longer. A lot of us spend our time trying to get God on our side. Whatever it is that we imagine for ourselves, we're busy trying to get God to come over here instead of us going to find out where God actually is. Even where God wants us to be. Some of the stuff that we do is we like to send God on errands that we should have taken care of. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if this happens in everybody's church, but churches that I grew up in, you know, God, go to the hospitals and visit the folks on the sick bed. Well, why don't you go visit <laughs> Lord, take care of my children while they're out tonight, well, why didn't you teach them the kind of things that they should be at uh, yeah. and where they should and should not be? And we like to send God on errands, no? Yeah. Anybody you know, like to, God, take care of the stuff that I was too busy to take care of, so we need you to go over there and, Lord, I speak to my boss. I know I was late for <laughs> two months in a row. But change my boss's mind so that they won't fire me. <laughs> Amen. We send God on errands to places that we should have taken care of. But God actually wants us more concerned about when we do prayer right. God wants us more concerned about the things that God wants us to do as opposed to the things that we want him to do. We find God, we look for God in the midst of our crisis when we should be connected to God all the time. Many times in prayer we're concerned about letting God know what we think, but we're not concerned about what God already knows. You catch the difference? We want to let God know what we think, what's in our mind, what's going on within us. What we think about this situation, that situation, and the third. But God already knows what's in front of us. Amen. And here's the real thing. We act as if God's goal is our comfort. Pay attention to this. 
This is St. James. Y'all listen? Our comfort keeps us crippled. It's actually true. Comfort is not the idea. People are comfortable in some of the craziest situations because it's what they know. It's what they understand. They can predict what responses they're going to get back in every situation that they're comfortable in. They know it. Our comfort actually keeps us crippled, keeps us locked into the places that we've always been, keeps us marching in the same direction, keeps the status quo up when the status quo might just be what's killing us. Let's talk about and look at some of what the most successful, uh, many of the successful people in the Bible did. Uh, you know what Abraham did when God wanted him to leave his family? Abraham actually heard God's vision for him. He did not go looking for God. I'm sure he was comfortable where he was. Y'all think Abraham was comfortable in the surroundings that he grew up in? He knew his father and uncles and everybody was all around. But God actually told him, I want you to leave your family and leave your country. And once he heard that, he actually began to put himself in motion to listen to God and understand what God wanted him. Sarah was blessed when she trusted God's promise. Before she trusted God's promise, she said, okay, I need to get a surrogate to have a child for me. But once she understood what God wanted to do, in spite of what she thought was possible, that's when she started to be blessed. That's when her family started to come together. David was blessed and successful at a farm when he accepted God's protection and provision. How many of y'all know that David was trying to protect himself before you know, his incident in the cave when God told him to leave Saul alone? He kept trying to protect himself. I used to be really bad about trying to protect my kids. You know, I figured out I cannot be with them 24 hours a day. It's unhealthy for me to follow them to school and sit in the class all of the time. That's just really downright unhealthy. To overlook them while they're playing with their kids and since I can't be there 24-7, I understood as much as I want to protect them, I am incapable. I don't have the capacity. David understood he couldn't protect himself and that God already had him covered. He was able to relax and trust that God had already seen him being blessed in a future he had not yet arrived in. And since God was going to bless him, he could trust God's protection and God's provision. When he was hungry, do y'all know that God actually literally fed him, provided for his every need? When he needed people to follow him, do you know that God actually provided people who were looking for a leader, who were lost and disconnected and in debt, and David led them to safety? Esther was blessed and affirmed when she stood in her name. Some of us think we can, some of us call it passing. Uh, some of us call it, I'm um, just going to leave my past behind and I'm not going to pay attention to anybody but myself. No, we can call it a bunch of things. And Esther had got to the palace and she thought that that was everything for her. She didn't have to worry about being hungry anymore. She didn't have to worry about anything else anymore. She was in the palace. But that was not God's best for Esther. Because God was actually concerned about saving his people. Not just about making Esther comfortable. All of those were good people before. We got any good people in the house? Yeah. You good people? Yeah. Y'all scared? Now, this, this is actually not one of my tricks. You, know? <laughs> you, you, should, you should think that you are good people. If you're doing good things, you have good things going for you. They became great when they saw and responded to God's vision from the time. We could go most of my life being good. Doing good things. Helping people out here and there. Being relatively kind in our neighborhood. God actually has a design greatness for every one of us. None of those people that I mentioned before are unique. God actually has a plan for all of our lives. God's plan is uh, developed out of the best use of our unique abilities, out of God's desire to provide the world's people with the needs around us. 
the work that will bring us peace, affirmation, and holiness. Those, those are three kind of separate things that God takes and look at us and then connects us to a perfect plan and path for our lives that will meet all of those needs. So first thing God is concerned about is what God wants. Y'all know that? In fact, there's a reasonably uh, good scripture that talks about seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know what that means? God says, take care of my business first. He's more concerned about what he wants to do in the world first. Then, but then he's also concerned about providing the people of the world with the need that they have, which is closely connected to what God's want, what his work is in the world. But then he also wants us to work in a way where we are connected with peace, where we have peace in our lives and peace in our relationships around us, where he affirms us in, for the unique people that we are. How many of y'all know if you're working out of an area of your giftedness, you are not going to be far from Amen. You see people doing that? They try just as hard. They can do anything that they want to do, so they're just determined to do X, Y, Z, right? If you don't have the gifts and ability to accomplish this thing, and that's been proven by your one, two, three, four, five times, try it, give it up, and maybe say, God, okay, where is it that I'm supposed to be at? What am I uniquely fit to do? What are my unique abilities? Lead me to that. So that I can not only be successful, but so that I can be affirmed for who I am. When we do what God has called us to do, we're not only affirmed in it, but we are refreshed in it. There's something about being successful. There's something about seeing the stuff that we connect to actually working, not only in our life, but in the life of others, that renews us. That's the kind of feeling that God wants us to have. There's another piece of it that uh, I won't say all this stuff about it, but all of us have some kind of trouble trauma in our lives. I know y'all don't want me to know about it. <laughs> You'd prefer that people thought that all of your life was just smooth like ice cream. have met with crisis and trauma and trouble that we actually need to work through in ourselves. Yeah. The best work that God calls us to do allows us to do that, allows us to correct the pain and the harm in our life, allows us to be healed in the process of serving God. God connects all of those things and whatever it is that he's calling us to do to our unique uh, path, to our unique vision. Uh, all of that is discovered in prayer, in conversation with God. This is what prayer is. I was hoping particularly to uh, put this up here so that you can copy it down and I'll make sure that you get it later. Prayer is a supernatural vehicle created by God. God creates prayer for us so that we can connect him. It allows natural human beings to communicate with God and for God so that God's plans for us, which reside in the supernatural, can be brought to fruition in the natural realm. In short, you know what that means? God knows what we're supposed to do. When we find out what God knows we're supposed to do, we can do it. The way we find out, this is really complicated, is actually talk to God. Right? Right. Have a conversation. What do you think about people, you know, they come talk to you and they never let you say anything? What do you think about that? I got a couple of them. <laughs> you know, all, you know they, they run in their mouth all the time. And when they take a breath, they don't. <laughs> I don't know about you, but those are not the kind of people that I like to be around. I want to be able to listen to what their thoughts are, to what that conversation is. But I also want them to listen to mine. Amen. Hello, somebody. Oh. Amen. Amen. Let me tell you something that really gets on my nerves. I try not to say this a lot, but what really gets on my nerves. Somebody come to me for help and all they do is talk. They don't ever listen. Mm -hmm. Right. That kind of bothers me. That's kind of like you showing up in a teacher's class and instead of you letting the teacher teach, you talk. Amen. You really can't profit and benefit a lot from conversation, from relationship, if you don't give room 
for the other person to actually participate in the conversation in a relationship. You need to get to know them, and particularly when it's God, you need to get to know what God knows. Not just communicate to God about what you're thinking. Here's the thing. God actually knows what you're already thinking. Now, I know that helps us to tell God what we're thinking. But God actually knows what we're thinking. You know what? God is waiting for us to get through our moments of frustration and our anguish and all of that so that he can actually help us understand what God knows is the answer for our concerns, our issues, our problems, what it is that he's going to affirm us. That's what prayer does best. <laughs> prayer is not just about us throwing all the stuff out in the world that we want. I used to throw stupid stuff out. God, when I'm walking down this street, let me find a lottery ticket that's worth $250 million. I wouldn't have any more problems. I know nobody thinks that crazy. <laughs> when we stop that kind of stuff and actually work to connect with God to understand, to get clarity about what God wants from us, we don't need the lottery tickets in life. We don't need to accidentally run into a blessing because when we see God clearly, God will actually lead us into the blessings and the peace and the affirmation and the renewal of us and of everybody else. God's ways. How many of y'all know this? God's ways. Uh, Hello, somebody. We can actually stop right there. Somehow we've gotten deluded into thinking that if we could just get God to thinking what we're thinking, we'll be all right. His ways are higher. They're better. They actually satisfy our deepest needs and greatest longings. So in the process of talking a little bit more about this prayer, I wanted to explore uh, actually uh, some uh, this unique individual that we know uh, in the scripture that uh, Pastor Keith and I actually worked through some stuff on uh, several years ago. It's Moses. Moses' life, what he came to, is actually not all of that unique in terms of people in the Bible, understanding what God wanted them to know. Moses did a similar thing to what a lot of us do. We understand what God calls us to do. We know the general calling of what, and then we run out like we know everything about it. Some people are called preaching, so rather than getting prepared, they just run out and start preaching. Some people are called to teach, so rather than actually getting prepared to teach, they just run out and start teaching. They don't listen to no other teachers. They know everything. Everybody else has done it wrong all of their lives, so they don't listen to anybody. Y'all know anybody like that, do <laughs> So, I mean, they just run out and start doing You So Moses actually jumped in too early before he got prepared and he failed. And then the other thing that's not all of that unusual, when you fail, what do you do? You hide. Because you don't actually want anybody to know that you failed. So you go somewhere where nobody knows your name. They don't know anything about your religion or your faith or what you're supposed to do, you think. It's interesting. When you go to those places where you think you hide, somebody always knows you. So he went and hid on the back side of a mountain, got married, and started doing a life that was not about the life that God had called him to. But the unique thing about God is God knows how to wait us out. And so when we get ready, he just says this a lot, when we get ready to listen, then God can communicate to us. Before that, we have a lot of blocks in our life we don't want to hear, we don't want to understand, so we put up a lot of roadblocks but God knows how to find us when we bring down some of those blocks and hits us in the right place so that he can grab our attention. So the first thing God wants us to understand when he's talking to us is to recognize and answer God's voice. There are a lot of voices that are out there. A lot of voices that we claim are God's voice. Some of it, all it is, is indigestion. <laughs> But we 
we like indigestion because we get to pretend that God is not talking if it doesn't work. God wants us to recognize and answer God's voice, so he puts it in a form that is unlike anything else. So for Moses, he saw a unique sight that he'd never seen before. He saw a bush burning that was not consumed. Anybody right here recognize that that's something that is not normal? It's on fire, but the leaves are still green. That, that's kind of strange, right? Amen. And so it drew him in. He, it got his attention. And at that point, Moses got in a conversation. Who are you? And God answered, I'm God. And he saw and heard and recognized God's voice. You know, the second thing that God wants us to do is to stop talking about God and start talking to God. A lot of us love to talk about God. God is able to do great and extraordinary things. Do you know that God did this for somebody else? God wants us to stop talking about him and begin talking to him. And then I know we got a lot of disagreements about this next thing, but trust me when I say this, God wants us to have enough sense to be afraid. I know, you know, people say, no, well, what God meant was respect. I think God wants us to have enough sense to be afraid of somebody who can actually wipe us out with a middle thought, not even a whole thought. Mm -hmm. Someone who can actually provide absolutely everything that we need and more. I think God wants us to be afraid of someone who has ultimate power in and over absolutely everything that we have or could have. Fear is actually a good uh, emotion to have in relationship to who God is. That should be the only emotion. But we should have enough sense when we're in the presence of a holy, eternal, all-powerful God to be uh, afraid. The other thing. God is concerned about God's people. God did not show up to Moses and say, Moses, I've been thinking about you. You know what God said? I heard the cry of my people. If we could just understand that, I don't know, it's hard for us to understand in our context when we're Constantly amassing money and wealth and bigger houses. I heard somebody say that earlier. And bigger cars. It's hard for us to understand that God's first concern is not me, myself, and I. God said, I've heard the cry of my people. I've seen their misery. I understand the struggle and the obstacles that are in front of them that they are caught up in. I've seen that, and I actually want you to go do something about it. Will it connect with us? Will it affirm us? Absolutely. But the starting point is not me. Go back to God is not concerned about your comfort. Your comfort keeps you crippled. God is concerned about the state of which God's people is in right now. And he's looking for people who will hear, who will talk with God, and who will understand what God is saying to us about directing us back to the people that we've left, that we've gotten lost from, that we feel some shame about because we failed before, but God is directing us back so that we can be successful in freeing God's people from the bondage, from the misery that they're in. Here's something else that I want you to pay attention to. A lot of us are super Christians. So we can't own up to our inadequacies. Moses actually says something that makes a whole bunch of sense. You know what he says? Who am I? I know some of y'all say, I know who I am. <laughs> who am I to do what you call me? That's really owning up to who we see ourselves as and in reality, what our true capacity is. But you know what? God never calls us to do what we already know how to do. 
if God is just calling you, us to do what we're already capable of doing, that's, that's a good way to understand it. It's not God who's doing the calling. God's vision for us is always bigger than us. It's more than we can handle on our own. So it's right to feel inadequate when God gives us an assignment. It is right to feel like we don't have the capacity to finish what God wants us to start. And a good part of us admitting is just, Lord, I don't know how to do what you ask me. Admit your fear. You know what one of the fears that Moses should have admitted? I don't want to go back because they might kill me. You know that was real? Because he had violated number one principle in Egypt. Don't go against the hand that fed you. You know, y'all say that all the time. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. I heard some of y'all say it last month. I did. I was true. Because somebody had bit the hand that fed them. We're afraid. We're afraid to go back and encounter people, whether we did them wrong or whether they just think we did them wrong. We're afraid of what they might think of us if we go back to the places where we failed it and they know our history. A lot of us are afraid to go back home. But when we can admit to our fears, we give a God an opportunity to lead us to victory over our fears. Here's the other part. See that God is what you need. In response to all of Moses's, I'm an adequate, I'm afraid, I need to know your name so that I can tell them. God gave them a name that wasn't a name, but that was every name. Y'all know this about this name? God says, I am that I am. The unique thing about that you know, is kind of a play on the language so that you couldn't really grasp what it is that God was saying about his name. So it means a couple of things. One, you can't control God. So that was kind of the thing back then. If I know somebody's name, I can control it. Hello? So it, it was one of the names that wasn't really a name, but there was every name. You can't control me, but understand, I'm everything that you need whenever you need it. I can satisfy every need that you have, every moment of your life. So it is both, you can't control me, but my desire for your life is to be in all of your moments, to be an ever-abiding presence so that you don't need to control me because if I can control you, you can be successful. Amen. Amen. Somebody liked it. I liked it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. A couple more quick things, and then I'll wrap this part up. Risk your inadequacies with God's presence. Know that you're incapable, but also know that God will handle God's part as long as we're able, we are willing to handle our part. And also know that God will give you more than you need. Moses kept complaining, I can't do this by myself. Moses actually did not need anybody else to do what his assignment was. Amen. But God says, since you whine so much, that's me. <laughs> Since you're whining so much, okay. I'll give you some extra help mm -hmm. to affirm you in the calling that I have for you. God does that for us. God sends us people along the way to confirm what God has already said. Do we really need somebody to confirm us? No, we don't really need. We want it. We want somebody to come up and pat us on the back and tell us we're doing a good job, we're in the right place. But that's actually not a need. That's satisfying our fears and inadequates. And oh, sometimes we can just be big babies. I said we. I said we. I said we. Did you want to accept the we? It's all right. I understand. I, I, can, I, I can sometimes uh, assume the fetal position in moments when I don't feel all of that good and successful, and God actually satisfies those needs for us. God has seen. 
He hasn't just thought. God has seen us at our best when we respond to what God communicates us to us in prayer. God has seen our success. God has literally seen our success. So what God wants to communicate to us, it's not his thinking, but his sight. His vision of where we are going to be the most successful that we could possibly be. And that's what God wants to communicate to us in prayer. How many of you want a vision? You want to see what God sees for you? Amen. I see some half hands. You scared of what I'm going to do? Thanks. <laughs> Have you, one, are you staying for the after church so we can engage you around some things? We've got some wonderful facilities, so that's one. <coughs> Have you prayed about it? Have you prayed about the vision? Not a, but have you prayed about the vision? Now you're scared. <laughs> how many of you would you, would you, how many of you would like someone to pray with you? for the vision that God has seen you for. Put my prayer over you said here. Rhonda and Jack and Rhonda and Paul. So here's what I want you to do. If, if, if you will, if you put your hands up real high, if you will put your hands up real high. So my prayer word is I need y'all to execute it. Rhonda. You two dudes, okay, and Diesel, and other Rhonda, and Jack, where are you at, Jack? Here's what I want to have. I want us to take a few minutes, and all the people who have their hands up, I want you to go to them and pray with them for God's vision for their life, okay? I'm going to make sure that we get everybody. We, I, I honestly want us to take time with this. Uh, take a little time with this. Because I, I want this not just to be a sermon. I want it to be a connection for us with God. The very best thing that any of us can do who believe in God is find out what God sees in us and what he sees for us. Number two on the list is once we see it, to actually do it. Amen? Amen. To see it, and then to actually do it. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff around that. We probably start feeling like we're inadequate. But it's something about connecting to the presence of God that helps us understand that where we are weak, y'all know it. Amen. 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 God steps in in the middle of our voids and completes it when we decide what we want to do best is connect with God and follow God. And He satisfies every need and desire we have. It's far too many of us who have not seen in ourselves what God wants to do. what God wants us to know. Not what we think, but what God knows about us. And God wants us to just trust Him enough. Even though we can't explain it, we can't figure it out, to know that if we'll just step into it, it's going to make us victorious. It's nothing like being in the very presence of an awesome and an almighty God. Yeah. It both throws us off balance and affirms us as the children of God. He loves us enough. He doesn't want us to just be good. God wants us to be great. 
We look at all the unique, wonderful people in the Bible and we're amazed. You know what God wants? God wants other people to look at us and be amazed. I want to look back and see people who are not just amazing, but who know that they are amazing because they said yes to an awesome God. If not joining us uh, after church today, I want you to do a couple of things whenever you see clearly what God wants for you. I need you to write it down because we have a habit of writing stuff. If we don't write it down, we remix it. Because if God really communicated, uh, it is unbelievable. If God said it, it is unbelievable that God would actually ask us to do that thing. If we've seen it, if we've seen it clearly, it, it will blow our mind. So write it down while you have the courage to write it down. Amen. And don't, don't insert you know, any lesser words in the picture. Write it down exactly as God revealed it. Write it down. So when you come back to look and see what God called you to do, say, oh, really, God did that? You don't have to remix it, all right? Amen. Y'all do that for us? Have the courage to write it down with God. Amen. There's somebody here today who does not have a church home, fellow brothers and sisters who can walk with you as you walk into the vision that God has for you. I want to invite you to come and join us as we courageously trust God for who God wants us to be and who God is. How doubt and words shall appear, words shall appear, oh, worship him.